To introduce our second uh, speaker uh, on this uh, session, and that's Alex Langerman. Um, I have actually known Alex since before he went to medical school. I think we wrote a paper together before you uh, went to Pritzker. Uh, he, uh, Alex is associate professor in the Department of Otolaryngology at Vanderbilt, um, and he's also at the Vanderbilt uh, Institute for Surgery and Engineering uh, and a faculty member of the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Society at Vanderbilt University. He's director of surgical analytics uh, and also of the program in surgical ethics. Um, Alex is a practicing head and neck surgeon whose research focuses on the interaction of ethics and data science in the operating room. And today he'll talk about candor and informed consent. So really a pleasure to welcome you back, Alex. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, it's always my favorite time of year to come to this conference. And, you know, I think Sarah's presentation reflects what's so exciting and awesome about the world that Mark has created, where clinicians will uh, see something in their daily practice and just think, hmm, I wonder, I wonder what to think about that. I wonder what to do about that. I wonder what other people have written about that. And suddenly a whole research avenue emerges. And I love this conference in large part because you see research as it's emerging out on new topics that haven't been discussed before. So uh, thank you, Mark, for including me and for creating this world. Um, uh, some disclosures. Uh, I, I do have a, I started a company on, on surgical data analysis, which I continue to advise. I'm not going to talk about its products or services. And uh, I, I, uh, Vanderbilt has a patent out on a, one of the, a surgical camera that I, I uh, developed and, and um, to, to a degree that intersects with my research, but uh, uh, it doesn't affect it. So um, what is surgical transparency? If there's a lot to unpack there, but the basic concept is we think about what should we be capturing in the operating room? And then what do we do with that data? And then lastly, if we have that data, how do we interface with patients? And what does that data also prompt us to tell patients that we might have previously not bothered to say or kept secret or were unsure how to talk about it. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today is that latter part, you know, preparing patients to understand the day of the OR and the language of transparency. And if you think about what is surgical transparency, I like to begin with the assumption, if you really want to be super, super transparent, that a patient could know everything that happened in the OR. Now, could is a very intentional word there. I'm not saying that they should necessarily, and I think that is part of the ethical analysis that's still ongoing. And I'm not saying must either, even if you could, you don't necessarily have to push it on a patient. You have to figure out what patients want to know, what they need to know, what they ought to know. And um, that's a big part of the research that I do. So um, this is the old joke about no one wants to know how sausage is made. And there are many uh, like sausage aspects of, uh, yeah, and it's, it's awesome, right? Um, the, the, there are many sausage aspects of the operating room, um, but I'm going to talk about just one today, which is this idea of uh, te training, teaching residents, and residents' autonomy. So how do we talk about it now as far as resident participation? Well, this is the most common way, is that little tiny disclosure on the operative consent, which used to just say whoever he or she may designate, and now consents have evolved a little bit to be even more specific. However, the degree to which surgeons actually go through these disclosures with their patients, anecdotal evidence suggests it's very rare and there's uh, not much study on it. So when you think about the language of transparency, what we really need is to create things that are both truthful and reassuring. What you don't want to do is cause a ton of anxiety by airing the dirty laundry of the operating room, the, the sausage argument, but rather create a language around discussing the realities of the OR and what happens in a way that also can be reassuring to patients, and that's the active research. This was a great study out of 2012, which uh, the, the authors asked patients if they support the idea of resident training. Most did, vast majority, greater than 90%. And then they asked patients um, to respond to their willingness to consent to various surgical scenarios that they describe, starting with first, the resident like watches the attending, and then the senior resident assists the attending, junior resident, the attending assists the junior resident, and uh, the attending observes the resident, and you see how dramatically the willingness to consent drops off. And so one of the challenges that this article points out is if you're really truthful, are you going to get patients who refuse to have surgery because they, they uh, are worried about a resident operating on them? And, and what is that worry based on? So um, in prior research, 
we found that patients really want to have a lot of knowledge and control over who does what in the operating room. So it's about, <clears throat> some think that residents should just be observing. Some say, well, if that person's going to operate on me, I want to know them. I want to vet them as I have vetted my attending surgeon. <coughs> and so that is in part uh, knowledge because knowledge is uh, reassuring. It's not a stranger, even hearkening back to this idea of ghost surgery. Um, you know, this is someone that's known to the patient, they can assess themselves. But it's also an attempt by the patient, a very legitimate attempt, to control the circumstances under which they will be put. Because they're asleep, they surrender their uh, autonomy uh, to a degree uh, because of the anesthesia and, you know, uh, the surgeons can do whatever it is they're going to do. And so they want to know and be able to design what's going to happen to them in that setting. So <clears throat> surgeons actually recognize this and respond to it. So here are some examples of what surgeons say they talk to patients about when they talk about the operating room and uh, residents and uh, uh, resident autonomy. Some surgeons talk about the idea of everything's under my control, and they kept in this ship. Some other surgeons will diminish the resident's role and say, well, you know, I mean, the resident's sort of like my secretary typing my letter, you know, and I'm the CEO of a company, or, you know, they're gonna do, uh, you know, the surgeon isn't doing the, the, the flying the plane the whole time, but the routine parts the resident will do. Well, that's actually not 100% true. You know, I mean, residents actually are supposed to do complex parts because they need to learn how to be a surgeon. Um, and so this sort of is, this is a Denton Cooley uh, with, uh, um, you know, implanting uh, uh, the, the first <laughs> artificial heart in the United States. And it's this idea of surgeon as God, you know, and all these other assistants. And what are they doing? They're just watching him. And, and that's the concept that many patients have is that there's the surgeon and then everyone else there is to learn by just watching, you know, avoiding the obvious that the only way to actually learn how to do surgery is to do surgery. Um, this is a great article from 1981, sort of a classic article in the idea of, uh, thank you, um, a classic article in the, in the idea of, of resident autonomy and resident training. The myth of the omnipotent surgeon needs to be laid aside. And uh, the reality is that it's a team, you know? We're all kind of doing the operation. <coughs> so here's a video. All right, so we have a surgeon with blue gloves on and a surgeon with white gloves on. Uh, who's the attending surgeon? The white gloves, show of hands. White gloves. Wow, smart audience. So, uh, and the attending surgeon, blue gloves. Yeah, yeah, so it's the blue gloves. Many patients, when you show them this video, think that the surgeon is the one holding the cutting tool, that that's the concept in there. Whereas, in fact, if you, you know, as uh, anyone who's been in the operating room would know, the, you know, the surgeon is clearly sort of controlling that situation. Um, so surgeons actually address this. Other surgeons, and the ones I showed examples of, actually address this directly with patients. They talk about the idea of taking two to tango. They talk about a team sport and that they're actually seeing the resident through the operation. Um, and that sometimes, you know, some, one pilot's flying, if it gets really complicated, another pa pilot takes over if there's some danger or some difficulties. And that does actually represent the reality of what happens in a training institution. <coughs> Other surgeons also elevate the team. They talk about the benefits of residents being in the operating room. I'm better with my team than I would be without. And there's more eyes on you. There's more chances to catch errors. So we need to think about the whole surgical team as we represent ourselves to patients, rather than representing only ourselves as the omnipotent surgeon. So we got really curious how patients would respond to actual videos in the operating room. And that's one of the videos that I showed you earlier. I'm going to show you this video again now with audio. It's going to be a little loud. I apologize. All right, if you can cut along the trachea. Great. Keep going. All right, you get the idea. When we show patients that video with audio, they began to realize, oh, in fact, it's not the person with the cutting tool. It is the person with the, uh, who's instructing, the person with the, the blue hands. And this is preliminary data. We're still actually doing this study, but I got an opportunity to collect just what we had so far. <coughs> Interestingly, when you think about who does the operation of the patients who figured out that it was, in fact, white gloves that was the trainee, 72% felt that the trainee indeed was doing the operation because they were the one cutting. And so that gets into the heads of what patients think about what it means to do an operation. So here's some quotes from that. White gloves, tweezers, and knife. <coughs> 
other patients, and again, this was second patient, was uh, uh, felt that it was uh, the white gloves that really did the operation. But really, they both look like they're doing something and they're participating. And then we had uh, a patient who felt like blue gloves really did the operation and described the resident as sort of a, a tool that the surgeon was wielding in the operating room. So that was a very interesting concept. There's more to come here. So we asked the patients, okay, well, you've seen the video. Now you kind of know what might happen. How would you talk about this to patients? How would you tell your colleagues you know, or your, uh, your uh, uh, fellow patients about this? And they talk a lot about this control idea, but also they're blatantly ominous about it. This resident may be doing some of the cutting and sewing. They'll be assisting, I'm guiding, I'm very much in charge. And I'm closely watching the proximity and advising. This is actually kind of what happens in the operating room. And uh, they may be helping me or they may actually be doing some of that. And this begins to give us some clues about how we might talk about it in a way that theoretically could be reassuring to patients. And I should ex say, when we asked certain patients to explain how they would, you know, say how they would explain it, we said in a way that would be reassuring to you or someone you know. And this is what they came up with. So still patients want to meet their surgeon, and I think that there's that aspect of it that we're falling short on. And they actually, they want to vet their surgeon to a degree. How much this is practical is a different question, but patients say, well, if someone's going to be operating on me or doing a substantial part of my operation, I want to know a little bit about them. I want to be able to assess them, really, you know, see if they care about me enough to uh, actually I could trust them to operate on me. So this is a work in project, as I said. And of course, this video that I showed just shows team surgery. It doesn't actually show the resident operating with the attending standing off to the side or uh, just holding retractors, that both are kind of doing it. And so I think you need to take this all with a grain of salt. So thinking about challenges to transparency, well, one, it's potentially anxiety provoking, and I think we really need to address that and focus on that. Second, surgeons may be worried that if they're honest about what happens and the realities of the operating room, the patients will say, well, I'm gonna go somewhere else. I'll go to a private hospital or go somewhere where someone will reassure me that they're gonna do the whole operation, which may or may not be true. Um, I think that uh, additionally, what we, you know, when you, anytime you think about trusting, patients trusting healthcare practitioners, we can't avoid the potential effects of gender and racial bias. And so any study that would look at how to use language in transparency has to be testing this language with various combinations of uh, providers and patients. Um, finally, if you're gonna talk about this, unless it's easy to talk about, it may generate a lot of questions. And if you're gonna introduce your residents to patients, there's challenging logistics there. The resident might not be with you in clinic that day. You might be meeting them on the day of surgery. And so working through that is one of the barriers here. And then lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about one other barrier, which is when you're an academic surgeon and you're training residents, to a degree you have a dual commitment. You're committing yourself to the patient and giving them the most excellent care possible, but you also want to give your residents an opportunity to become the best surgeon possible. This was an article that began to address this um, and, uh, in uh, 2012. As a pro, they talk about this idea of our duty to pass on knowledge to the next generation of physicians. And as a con, they say, well, patients don't you know, see that dual commitment. What they see is you know, they want to get the best possible care of surgery you know, that they can get. Whether the resident trains or not is sort of irrelevant to their goals. And I think you can go both ways on this, and this is an interesting area for further debate. I want to present you with one example from interviews that I did that I, I thought the audience might find thought provoking. So uh, we have an attending neurosurgeon who's talking to me and explaining this anecdote. He's in the room, he's not scrubbed in. He hears the shh sound, hears some suction going on, up, you know, when the resident's operating on the brain. I've got some bleeding. He says, so I, you know, I go over there, I look down the scope, yeah, that's arterial bleeding, and the resident sort of explains what happened. And uh, he asks the attending, are you gonna scrub in? The attending says, no, I'm not gonna scrub in. You're gonna fix this because you're gonna be a vascular fellow in about three months. They'll expect you to handle this. I need you to know that you're gonna be capable of handling this kind of thing in the future. So I'll be here, I'm your resource, but you're actually gonna do this operation in, in, in a time when there was beginning to be a potential complication. And I think you'd be able to get themselves out of it. And he talks about how the resident came into his office, very emotional, the biggest event of a surgical training. He finally felt like, wow, I can go out and be an independent surgeon. And if you uh, are an academic surgeon or an academician thinking about giving residents autonomy and teaching them how to be independent surgeons, it seems like a really pretty amazing example of that. And if you're the patient's 
on the table, this sounds horrifying. You know, my brain is, you know, my brain is bleeding, and the attend, the person that I, you know, who knows if the patient even met the resident, the person that I was expecting was doing my surgery is standing there, you know, giving them their opportunity to 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 win or fail at the expense of this patient's brain, which is 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 something that makes transparency that much more difficult because these are real things that happen in the operating room, and how are we going to talk about them? I'm not sure, and that's, that's a big part of the research that we're doing. So um, surgeons actually recognize this dual commitment and uh, you know, try to find ways to describe it to patients, but we're not sure how this is going to resonate. And that's all I have. Thanks very much. <laughs> Alex, while people are coming to the mic, can I uh, take the prerogative of this moderator of asking you a question? Uh, so it seems to me that there is somewhat of a metaphysical question about who is doing the operation. Because as an intern, when my attending took me through a lymph node biopsy, I felt I did the operation. Right, right, right. But I'm sure if you ask the attending, you would say, he didn't do anything. Yeah. He cut where I said he cut mm -hmm. and he did what I said to do. And so, so I'm not even sure what it means to say someone is doing the operation. Well, I think you're right. And so we can answer that uh, from different perspectives, but we can also think about it in a philosophical sense, philosophical sense of what it means to do it. <laughs> I think where that question gets interesting is as you go from being the dumb, um, uh, the, the, the dumb assistant who just you know, cuts where you're told, and, and you know, as an attending surgeon, we have to watch ourselves because it can be very easy to provide no learning opportunity whatsoever to a resident other than how to hold the cutting tool. Um, and and they'll, they'll leave the operation, they'll think that they did it, and in fact, they have no idea how to do it themselves. And so that graduated progression of responsibility. So what does it mean to do an operation? Well, part of it is the individual components of judgment and uh, decision making and uh, technical skill. But part of it <laughs> is the responsibility that you're taking over for that uh, surgery and its outcome. And lastly, who does the operation? Well, it's really the team that does the operation. And I think that's the other thing that we need to talk about. Instead of saying, you know, I'm gonna do your surgery, we're gonna do your surgery. And I think that is a, an important, like all the, the, the um, philosophy fits into that one change in word as to uh, how you represent it to patients, but it's an interesting question. So um, there's a lot of people with the mic, so I gotta ask you all to ask surgical succinct questions and surgical succinct answers. Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> um, no. I'm, no, that's fine. Uh, Emily Landon, University of Chicago. Along the same lines as what Dr. Angelos is saying, I, I get that it's definitely different for patients for them to be asleep, like physically asleep. But I think in many cases, there are this sim similar issues along with consulting, like when uh, your doctor in the hospital consults another team and you just get whoever's on that day. And I think there can be some, um, some crossover between a lot of these things that patients may not be physically asleep, but I think their involvement is about the same level. That's well, I think that's great. You know, and consultation's an important aspect. Yeah. Yes. What a great presentation. Thank you. I have a, one question. So you, the transparency I love, but an element that I tend to emphasize, the tradition of medicine is from generation to generation teaching and advancing knowledge. And like I said yesterday, in a context Patients, in my view, cannot selectively take one element of all that. If they want it, they get the full package, including that tradition of education. Yeah, it's a good point. And certainly, if you uh, say, if someone says, I don't want a resident involved in my care, one, it's probably not good for them because, uh, in fact, that breaks up your usual routine. But secondly, um, you know, you, one could make the argument that um, th this is going to uh, disproportionately favor patients who are uh, empowered, patients who are knowledgeable about the healthcare system, or disadvantaged patients who perhaps they're ones that will only be trained on are the people who don't know to speak up and, and complain about it. And so uh, I, I think in, in that sense, we really do have a commitment to treat every patient the same way re regarding the inclusion of trainees. 
Terrific talk, thank you, Kodish from Cleveland. Um, I, I see an opportunity here for um, Moving this earlier in the educational process, I spend every Tuesday morning now with first and second year med students, and they worry about this. And as we do our ethics and humanities education, I would just make the point we should start having these conversations with students early on so they can get comfortable being uncomfortable. Love it. Yeah. Hi, uh, David Keefe from uh, Boston. <laughs> Excellent talk, raised a lot of questions. One of which, in my mind, is what is the public's perception of um, what is right and what is wrong here in terms of involvement of residents in their procedures? You touched on that a little bit, but I was wondering if there's more data on that. I don't have much more data about that, but you, the thing that you raise, I mean, you know, there's plenty of papers that show that patients think they watch, but as far as the exact numbers of that, that's, that, that, that I, I don't, uh, know that exists, um, but um, you talk about public perception, and a lot of public's perception is from things like TV shows, and this, this harken back to research on CPR, where, where uh, people felt like CPR was always successful because it was always successful in shows, and actually there was lobby to have more truth in the depiction of CPR, and there may be an opportunity here to lobby for more truthful depictions of, of training that uh, uh, may help patients understand, or uh, uh, addressing the transparency issue in a way that uh, shows a, a, a OR scenes that might be depicted on a TV show to help patients understand the, the realities of it. Thank you. Mark. As, as the number of uh, surgical patients who are awake increases, I know that you and former student here, Claire Smith, had written a series of papers. Could you just say a word about the awake patient's attitude t towards these uh, encounters with surgeons? Thanks, Mark. Uh, so so the, the, the study, the research that we did, asked surgeons how they behaved around uh, awake patients who could hear what was going on. And very clearly, they said, oh, I teach less, or I whisper when I'm teaching. I, I, I try to obfuscate the fact that there's some training going on, which shows that surgeons are uncomfortable with this idea and are fearful that patients are going to be uncomfortable with this idea. Um, when we talk to patients about it, when they hear whispering, they get more worried, you know. And so, in fact, uh, um, you know, uh, many patients said, well, I, you know, I expect that there's going to be teamwork going on. I, I just wish the surgeon would have explained it to me ahead of time. And that, that data is still coming out, but I, I think it's an important population. If you want to think about cameras in the operating room, start with something that happens already, which is awake patients and how it changes team behavior. Deborah Leff from Chicago. Um, the days of see one, do one, teach one are over. Yeah. And we now have many other tools in terms of surgical education, including simulation, <coughs> simulators, which um, aid the, the technical aspects of learning and milestones so that in the olden days, we didn't really, we weren't graded or assessed um, in, in a more intentional way uh, as we are now. And I think that even the graduating surgical trainees still feel uncomfortable in many cases mm -hmm. and are, um, you know, and, and need a lot of mentoring. And that's sort of the job of the senior surgeons as these youngsters get out into practice to really watch and mentor and guide them. That's right, uh, absolutely. And there's a lot of data about residents coming out feeling unprepared, uh, but there's also something completely amazing about getting mentored by your colleagues. And you know, I still get that. Um, Sir. As a surgical resident, I'm often tasked with obtaining some or all of informed consent from patients. And I'm curious in how trainees themselves discuss their own autonomy with patients and what those conversations look like, if you have any information. Let's write a paper. I'd be curious about that. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're right. And the only thing I would say about that right now is it's really important for the attending surgeon to address this early because that actually makes the difference. Uh, uh, and I, and I, I say that more anecdotally, but I think this would be a really interesting study to do with how, how residents perceive that. So thank you. Thanks very much.